Well, good morning. I better preach good after that. Can't have him say all that good stuff and then be like, wah, wah. <laughs> well, real quick, um, I just wanted to take a moment, and after Pastor Ed took a few moments and doted on me, I just want to tell you guys, I've been here, like he said, just a little over a year, and I love this church. And, and, I, say, and I say this church, and I don't mean this building, and I don't mean this stage. I mean I love the people here. Uh, and one of the things I love is that we have a visionary leader. And not, not every church has that. As a matter of fact, the majority of churches don't have that. And that's one of the things that in my year here, I have just learned and gleaned already so much about what it looks like to be a, a leader that, is, that goes to God and receives a vision from God. And that's what we have. In Pastor Ed, we have a visionary leader, someone who receives vision from God, who dreams big, and then when he gets that dream, is like a bulldog and will not relent until he feels like we're going towards everything that God has for us. So real quick, can we just give, give our leader a hand real quick? And in the past couple services, Pastor Ed shared with everybody else, but for some reason he didn't share with you all. When they were coming to meet us, they kind of came to meet us like, well, we'll just do our due diligence. This guy sent us his resume, and we'll go, we'll go check him out. But I was always excited to meet you, so... And then I just have one more thing. You guys prayed for the students right now, just, just now for camp, but I want to ask you to go a step further. Uh, and I just want to challenge you because myself and, and the adult leaders and even a lot of the students, we've been preparing our hearts, we've been praying, and I believe with everything in me that there are not 53 students going to summer camp for no reason. I believe that God wants to wreck these kids' lives and then build them back up in the name of Jesus. I believe that God wants to do something awesome, something supernatural, and he wants to change them forever. And so if you believe that with me, would you just join with us, and would you just commit for this next week, Monday through Friday, just to pray for these students? If you're willing to say, Pastor Daniel, I'll pray, would you just raise your hand? Just pray for these students. The Bible says the, the prayer of a, or a the fervent, effectual prayer of a righteous man availeth much. So I believe that with your prayers on top of ours and their expectations, God's going to do miracles this week. Amen? Amen. Amen. All right, well... I'm just going to share a little personal story once again before I dive into, into the, the message on integrity. Last time I spoke here, it was December 26th, the day after Christmas. And there might, there might have been a few of you here now that were there then. But for those of you who weren't, I'm going to kind of fill you in. The two days before the last time I spoke were probably the craziest days in my entire life. It started on December 24th, Christmas Eve. My wife and I went to a lovely Christmas Eve service, had a wonderful dinner, and on the way home, we totaled our car. Merry Christmas. <laughs> we hit a wild hog in the middle of the road. And because it was so black, it just blended in. It, it was like we hit a, a ramp. I mean, all four wheels off the ground. It was just bizarre. It was so crazy. We totaled our car, and, and, and we're like, okay, whatever. We love Christmas. My wife and I love Christmas. If I could, I would apply to be Santa's little helper. I would even, even if he made me have funny ears, I would do it. I love Christmas. Christmas is the bomb. We love it. So we're like, we're not going to let a stupid hog ruin our Christmas. You know what I'm saying? We're going to have fun. Even if we have to walk to wherever the fun is going to be. And we did. So we, we walked to actually uh, the executive pastor, Eric Strom, and his family's house, and we spent Christmas with him. And it was awesome, them and his family, and we had fun. And, and we got back to our condo on Christmas night, and we got another Christmas present. We were locked out of our condo. And so I'm standing there. It's like 10.30 at night, Christmas night, and I'm jiggling the doorknob. You know how you do it if you've ever locked yourself out? It's like you, you, you keep trying, just hoping. It'll open eventually, you know, if I try hard enough. If I will it to, it'll unlock. Didn't happen. So I'm jiggling, and I look over at my wife. I'm like, you know what? It's okay. She usually has a, a, a spare key in her purse. I'm like, Ashley, hey, you got the extra key because... I lost mine, and, and the door's locked. She's like, my purse is inside the condo. <laughs> uh. So, anybody here ever tried to call a locksmith on Christmas night? <laughs> yeah, good luck. Didn't ha once again, it didn't happen. So, I did what any red-blooded American male would do, and I broke the door down. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it was a little unnerving, though, because it broke really easily. <laughs> so I was like, yeah. Well, anyway, that was the two days leading up to the last time I preached. 
And the reason I'm telling you all this is because this last week, my wife and I were out of town. We were in Minnesota visiting family over the 4th of July. And I remembered the craziness of these last two, two day, those last two days. And then I kind of thought, between now and, and my next time preaching, there's about 1,500 miles in an airplane. So I'm like, dear God. <laughs> Please, if you want to sh- teach me something or show me something, don't let it be with an airplane accident. Please don't let there be any flying hogs that we could hit. I was just praying. I mean, genuinely praying. And every time it was like turbulence, I was like, I'm not even Catholic. I did it. Just because. Just, just to be sure. You know what I'm saying? I'm like, Ashley, we need, we need to get together and pray because we're two or more are gathered, girl. And we need to be safe on this plane. So, I'm telling you that to say, praise God, we had a completely uneventful trip. I'm here safely. We didn't hit any hogs. We didn't crash any cars. We didn't lock ourselves out of anything. So praise God. Let's give God a hand real quick. We're in the middle of our series. Actually, we're kind of coming on the tail end of our series at the core. Pastor Ed shared a little bit about it. Uh, and we've been going just through the 10 core values that we have as a church that Pastor Ed has prayed through and and that we as a church, we kind of want to align ourselves and use as accountability that these are our core values. As Living Waters Community Church, these are our core values that we're going to live and abide by. And the one that I'm going to be speaking and sharing with you on this week is integrity, the core value of integrity. But before we dive in, can we just take a moment and just have a moment of prayer? God, I come to you right now in Jesus' name, and I ask that you would just bless our gathering this morning. God, I pray that uh, this message wouldn't simply be my words or my thoughts, but it would be your words and your thoughts through me, God. Holy Spirit, I pray that you would do as only you can and use this message to speak to every individual heart here today exactly what they need to hear. And God, I also just pray that, that the meditation of my heart and the words of my mouth would be pleasing to you. God, would you help me to deliver this message in a way that, uh, that accurately represents your heart? And I just pray for the hearers. I pray for everyone here, God, that their hearts would be ready and open and willing to receive what you have for them. God, I pray that we would be changed by your word this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, as we, as we start talking about integrity, I just want to share with you guys kind of our church scripture when it comes to integrity. We've kind of decided that we have a church scripture, and it's Proverbs chapter 10, verse 9. And it says this, Whoever walks in integrity walks securely, but whoever takes crooked paths, and that phrase there, crooked paths, can mean perverts their way or whoever compromises their integrity, whoever does that will be found out. Anybody in here ever been found out? I heard some groans. Uh, that's a telltale sign. You've been found out before. Well, I, when I read this verse, I automatically flash back to second grade in a time that I was found out. It was a second grade. I was in Mrs. Henderson's class. And as elementary school age kids can do, we got a little bit bored. And so we did something I'm sure none of you spiritual people have ever done before. We started passing notes. And as passing notes usually goes, the content of those notes was slightly inappropriate and probably offensive, as much so as it could be from second graders. Um, So a few of my classmates and I were passing notes all day long. We kind of have this whole game going, you know. We're secretly under the desk, you know, like we're walking by each other like a baton, like, here, pass it, you know. And we're like thinking we're slicker than snot, you know, like we got this. We're we're passing notes all day. It's kind of fun, making fun of the teacher, writing little whatever. Stuff that you don't want anyone to see if they're not in the little note-writing crew. And so towards the end of the day, there was one note-passing exchange that got a little bit bobbled. It was almost like if you've seen a, a baton race, when they hand the baton in and they kind of bobble it and whatever. So it kind of drew a little bit more attention to us than I was hoping for. So I'm going to grab the note, and it, it kind of got bobbled, whatever. And then I stub it in my pocket, and I'm, I'm like, nobody saw. Nobody saw. Don't worry, Daniel. Nobody saw. You're, you're okay. Nobody noticed. And so I didn't know what to do, so I, I had to pretend like I was up standing up for a reason. So I go to the pencil sharpener, right? Because that was the go-to, obviously, the old-school pencil sharpener. And I'm like, hoping the, the sound of the pencil sharpener will cover up my chattering teeth because I just knew somebody noticed we're passing notes. And then it happened. I hear, Daniel Young. I'm like, this Daniel Young or, or this one? I'm, I'm just hoping. No, nope, it's me. Daniel Young, what is in your pocket? I'm like, Lint? (laughs) 
What besides Lent? You know how teachers would get. I said, I got a note. Just bring that note right here. She started reading it, and obviously it was something we didn't want her to read, so we got in a whole lot of trouble. But take yourself, if you could just empathize with me, with second grade Daniel. The moment when I heard, Daniel Young, I knew, found out, busted. That sinking feeling. And maybe it's been a while for some of you since you've been in second grade, so let me, let me put this analogy out there. It's that feeling when all of a sudden you see red and blue flashing lights <laughs> in your rearview mirror, and you look at the speedometer, and you're 15 miles per hour over. Found out. It's that sinking, oh, feeling. Busted. Nobody likes that feeling. Nobody enjoys it at all. And those are kind of funny examples, but the fact of the matter is, and the truth is, being found out can actually be not funny at all. It can be completely devastating. It can com be completely world-shattering. And when I think of examples of, of a really, really serious stories of people being found out, I think of some prominent Christian leaders in the past couple decades who have been found out. Uh, I think specifically of a guy named Ted Haggard, who was the pastor of New Life Church in Colorado Springs. 15,000 plus people. He's one of the most prominent leaders in the evangelical Christian circles. And he got found out. He, he, he was compromising his integrity and he got found out and it was completely devastating. He lost everything. Everything. He ruined his life. Nobody wants that. None of us want to feel what it feels like to be found out. And sometimes even as bad as, as the feeling of actually being found out is living a life in fear of being found out. See, that can actually be worse than being found out itself. See, I know in my own life, and I've known a bunch of people who being found out actually was kind of a relief because you no longer had to hide. You no longer had to cover up. You no longer had to scheme and worry. It was almost like, oh, everything's out in the open. It can be just as miserable worrying about being found out. And nobody wants that. Nobody wants to experience that. But see, what I love what I absolutely love about this verse in Proverbs is look what it says with me real quick. Whoever walks in integrity walks securely. And I did a little word study on that word securely, and it's actually the Hebrew word batak. And it's used numerous times throughout the New Testament. And in other places or in the Old Testament, in other places in the Old Testament, it's translated as boldly, confidence, assurance, safely, or even carelessly. And so when I read that now, I see that word securely. I read into that, man, if I walk in integrity, I can walk with, with boldness. I can walk with confidence. I can walk with assurance. I can almost walk with a carefree, not worrying attitude because I don't have to worry about being found out. How many of you guys want to live like that? You want to live boldly. You want to live confidently. You want to live with assurance, not having to look over your shoulder or worry if anybody's seen what you did. And that's exactly what this verse is telling us. You can walk securely. And I think the majority of us, the majority of all people want that. We desire integrity. I don't know anybody. I think you'd be hard-pressed to find a single person who would say, man, they wake up in the morning, they got their newspaper and their coffee, and they think to themselves, I would really love sometime throughout today to compromise my integrity and eventually be found out. Nobody says that to themselves. Nobody wants that. Almost everybody, at least part of everybody, I believe, desires integrity, desires to walk securely. And so the next question becomes, how? How do we walk in integrity? How do we do it? And so what I want to do for the next few moments is, I believe one of the best ways to learn how to do something is by walk, watching someone who is good at it. See, I grew up playing basketball, and I wanted to be better at basketball. I wanted to know how to, how to play basketball well. So I would watch somebody who was better than me at basketball, and I would, I would learn, I would observe exactly what they did, and I would, especially I would watch the best of the best at basketball. I grew up watching Michael Jordan, and I wanted to be like Mike. You know what I'm saying? I'd be out there on the playground sticking my tongue out, <laughs> biting my tongue and stuff. Why? Because Michael did it. So I want to do it because Michael's the best. So I watch his life, I observe from his life, and I would apply things I saw Michael Jordan do because I knew it would help me be a better basketball player. 
And I believe the same thing is true in the area of, of integrity. And so what, we're, what, what I want to do just for the next few moments, I want to look at who I think is one of the best of the best, one of the greatest men of integrity in the Bible. And I want to just look at his life, just observe it, and pull some lessons and some observations we can apply to our own lives in learning how to walk in integrity. And the person that I want to look at is Daniel. I know, I know, before you go snickering, <laughs> it's only coincidental, Okay. Jeez, tough crowd. It's only coincidental. So we're just going to look at the biblical char- character of Daniel. And what I want to do specifically is I want to look at two stories in particular that jump out to me as two major moments of integrity. So if you're taking notes, just write that down. Two major moments of integrity. And from these two stories, we're going to pull four observations or four lessons on how to walk in integrity and how to, that we can learn from Daniel and how to walk in, in integrity ourselves. And the first story that that I want to point out to you guys is in Daniel chapter 1. And I'm not going to go through it verse by verse because these are pretty familiar stories. In Daniel chapter 1, we see that Judah, or the the kingdom uh, of Israel at the time, was kind of split in two. And Judah was was actually conquered. They were captured, taken over completely by Babylon, uh, whose king at the time was a guy by the name of Nebuchadnezzar. Raise your hand if you ever heard of good old Nebi. Nebuchadnezzar, hey, he's a famous guy. So Nebuchadnezzar takes him over and, and he commands... He wants the most handsome, the most intelligent, the most capable men in all of Judah, from the the noble family. He wants to bring them all in, and he wants them to to work for him. He's going to train these guys. He wants to teach them uh, the language and the literature of Babylon. He's going to give them a daily portion of food from his very own table. And for three years, he wants to train them and then bring them into his personal service. And so Daniel and and a bunch of his friends who, who were renamed upon being captured, they were renamed Shadrach. Meshach and Abednego, these guys were part of that group. They were part of those guys who were commissioned to be in the king's service. And at first glance, when you first read it, you think, man, that's a pretty sweet deal. These guys got themselves into, into a pretty good situation. Because most people, when, when they were taken over and, ca- and taken captive, they were either killed on the spot or they were forced into hard, hard slave labor. But these guys, they kind of had it plush. They kind of had it made in the shade with a glass of lemonade. You know what I mean? Living in the palace, eating the, eating the king's food. They got to learn a bunch of cool languages. Everyone probably looked at them and was like, oh man, I want that job, you know, out in the field working. And these guys, it looked like they had it awesome. But if you know the story, you know that there was a problem. See, Daniel was a devout Jew. He was was a faithful man of God. And that being the case, he, he knew the Torah, the law of Moses, like the back of his hand. He knew it in and out. And he knew that in the law of Moses, there were very strict rules about what they could and could not eat as the people of God. And so when, when the portion from the king's table was brought to him, he immediately knew this food is on the don't eat list. And he was immediately faced with a decision to eat the food and willfully, knowingly disobey God. He, he could eat the food and, and knowingly compromise his integrity or... He could, he could do the opposite. He could stand strong. He could be a man of integrity and refuse the food. And if you know the story, once again, you know the Bible says that Daniel refused to defile himself. He refused it. He wouldn't eat it. And the guard who was in charge of them, this made that guard a little bit nervous because he's like, if you don't eat this food, you're going like, to lose weight, you're going to look sick, then I'm going to get in trouble. Can we talk about this? Daniel said, okay, I'll make you a deal. For the next 10 days, give me and my friends vegetables and water, and that's it. And then compare us after 10 days to the rest of these guys. The guard said, all right. So sure enough, 10 days later, Daniel and his friends looked stronger. They looked more healthy. They looked more alert. They looked better than all the rest of the guys. So the guard actually took away the king's food from the rest of the guys and said, you, go, you all give veggies and water. And I can hear the collective groan. Oh, man, no more dessert. Veggies and water. And then the story goes on to say that God gave Daniel and his friends understanding and knowledge. He gave Daniel understanding, especially to know dreams and interpretations of dreams and visions. And then when they were done with their three years of training, these guys were actually compared to the rest of the guys in their same school, you could say. And they were found to be ten times better in every area than the best, even the best magicians and enchanters in the whole kingdom. And what a story about integrity. What a story, what a powerful, how easy would it have been for Daniel just to, just to eat a little bit of the food, just to do what everybody else was doing and just take some food. But he said, no, he refused it. 
And the second story I just want to quickly recap for you. Fast forward five chapters in the book of Daniel. And we actually have a new king. It's not the good old Nebi anymore. It's a king by the name of Darius. And we see that Daniel is still highly favored by this new king Darius because he was still a man of integrity. So in this new king Darius, is, he, he's kind of making a decision. He's going to change his governmental structure a little bit. And he sets up what the Bible calls 120 satraps with three administrators over them. And Daniel was one of these three guys. So that means he was one of the top four most powerful men in the kingdom. But he even distinguished himself above that. And the king decided to put Daniel over the entire kingdom because he was a man of integrity. And this did not make the satraps and other administrators very happy. They had a little bit of a jealousy issue. And so they, they decided to get together and they wanted to trip Daniel up. They wanted to catch him doing something shady. But they couldn't. They couldn't find anything wrong with him because he was a man of integrity, day in and day out, constant integrity. So they knew the only way we're going to catch Daniel doing something is if it has to do with his God because he's so faithful to his God. So they went to the king. They did a little kissing up, a little flattery. They said, oh, oh king, live forever. We have an idea for you. We think that you should make a decree. You should make a new law. And and not just any law, king. You should make it the kind of law that can't be repealed, that you can't go back on. And because we think you're so awesome, the law should be that nobody's allowed to pray to any god except you. And the king thought to himself, I like it. That makes me feel good about myself. Make it a law. And we're all like, ugh. Because we know the story. But then, then the story goes... Now there's this law, 30 days, nobody can pray to anyone except King Darius. But the Bible says that Daniel goes back and he prays three times a day with his window open toward Jerusalem, just as he always had. He continued, and the satraps, they went and they, and they saw him. They caught him, and they went and tattled to the king. Hey, king, this guy Daniel that you think is so awesome, yeah, he's praying and he's not praying to you, buddy. Tattletales. Nobody likes tattletales anyway. Satraps. So they tell on him, And King Darius is like, what have I done? He has this uh uh-oh moment, right? Like, what a dummy. Because he loves Daniel, but he knows he cannot repeal this law. So he's forced to command that Daniel is thrown into the lion's den because that was the punishment set up. And then it says, so he makes this command, and and then all night long the king can't sleep. He just can't sleep. He's tossing and turning. Evidently they didn't have sleep number beds back in ancient Babylon or something. Maybe he just needed to change his sleep number. I don't know. But he couldn't sleep. He couldn't wait to go check on Daniel. The next morning he sprints to the tomb and he, he, he has it, or to the den and he rolls the stone away and Daniel's just hanging out. What's up, king? Petting the cats. <laughs> this is Fifi. Just chilling. Not a scratch, not a ding, not a bruise, nothing. The king's like, Daniel, what happened? He said, God sent an angel to shut the mouth of the lions. Darius is like, wow. Pulls Daniel out of there and he throws everyone who falsely accused him and their families in. And they weren't quite as comfortable as Daniel. It didn't end so well for them. And the story ends with King Darius making a brand new decree that every nation under his control from that point on would fear and reverence the God of Daniel. What a story of integrity. Man, what a story, what a, what a, what powerful moments of integrity that, that we see in Daniel's life. And so what I want to do is let's just, I just want to pull out four observations that we can apply to our own lives from these stories. And the first one is this. Walking in integrity seems risky, but keeps you secure. Put yourself in Daniel's shoes just for a moment. You've just been captured, you're now a prisoner, and the king is showing you favor, letting you live in his palace, letting you eat his food. I don't know about you guys, but it wouldn't be very high on my to-do list to reject food from that king. If I wanted to, like, stay alive, maybe, I I wouldn't reject anything from that king, especially awesome food. Hey, you know what I'm saying? It was risky. It was risky. And then think... In Daniel chapter 6, there's a new law and the punishment he knew was being thrown 
in the lion's den. Once again, I don't know about you, but I wouldn't be super eager to break any law that if I got caught would have me hanging out with lions. With no cage in between. Risky. He was literally risking his life. Or so it seemed. Because look at the end of each of those stories. He was kept secure. And not only that, he was shown amazing favor by God. He was made the second most powerful man in the whole kingdom because of his integrity. And and the very ones who who thought that they were scheming, that they were going to get ahead in the end, they were the ones who ended up being destroyed. See, we all face decisions like this every day. Have you ever, have you ever, are you currently in a situation where it seems risky to hold your integrity? Does it seem like you might lose something by standing for what you believe? Does it seem like you might lose money by keeping your integrity? Does it seem like you might lose a relationship? Does it seem like you may be risking popularity or even your job by walking in integrity? Don't be fooled. It only seems risky. In the end, it keeps you secure. Because the opposite, the opposite is what the devil tries to tempt us with. He tries to tempt us to think, you can can get ahead, you can gain something. It'll be okay if you just bend just a little, just just a, nobody's going to see. And you'll get ahead, you'll gain, you'll be better off. Don't be fooled by that. That's the same lie that the satraps bought. And look where it got them. It got them and their families thrown into the den with lions. See, sometimes when when we give in to temptation and we compromise our integrity, it hurts not only us, it hurts the ones we love. Don't buy it. Don't be fooled. The Bible says in Proverbs 14, 12, there is a way that appears to be right, but it leads to death. In the end, it leads to death. That describes perfectly to me that moment when when you're, you're thinking. I mean, you see an opportunity to compromise your integrity and it looks like you will gain It appears to be right. That's going to lead to death. Seems risky, but it keeps you secure. The second thing I think we can learn from the life of Daniel is this. Public integrity starts in private. Let me say that again. Public integrity starts in private. Daniel chapter 6 verse 10 tells us that Daniel three times a day got down on his knees and prayed, giving thanks to God. And then it says, just as he had done before. And when I read this story, it leads me to believe that Daniel had been praying like this for years and years. And the reason that I believe that is because I don't think you risk being thrown into a lion's den for something you just started a week ago. Like, yeah, I started this whole praying thing. It's kind of new for me. It's kind of cool. I kind of like it. I think I'll risk being thrown in the lion's den for it. I don't think so. I think this was so much a fabric a part of the fabric of who Daniel was, that he could not, regardless of the consequences, stop having integrity in private. He could not stop praying. He could not stop being faithful to his God. It wasn't something he did. It was a part of who he was. And I think we need to learn from this lesson. Long before, long before Daniel ever, I believe Daniel was ever faced with the option of eating the king's food, he was walking in private integrity. I heard, I heard a story that a pastor used a while ago, and it stuck with me to this day to kind of pr- show this point. He said, trying to walk in public integrity without having private integrity first is like having a burglar bust into your house, threaten your family, and then to fight him off, you run downstairs real quick and start pumping iron <laughs> to get stronger so you can fight this guy. It doesn't make any sense. It would never work. And the reason, the principle behind that is because you have to prepare ahead of time for the coming struggle. I'm going to say that one more time. You have to prepare ahead of time for the coming struggle. Public integrity starts in private. The third thing I think that we can learn from this is that integrity or lack thereof is contagious. Integrity or lack thereof is contagious. Let's just look at the life of Daniel. Who were his best friends in the world? Who were his homies? Who were his crew? The guys that he did life with day in and day out. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And these were three 
guys who walked in integrity in their own right. These guys have their very own story in the book of Daniel in, in chapter 3 where they refused to compromise their integrity and they got thrown into a fiery furnace because of it. Seemed risky, but it kept them secure in the end, didn't it? And this is who Daniel walked with, talked with, hung out with. Man, when he had the opportunity to compromise his integrity and eat the food, he probably had Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego standing around like, I don't know, dog. I don't know about that. <laughs> Yahweh is watching. You know what I'm saying? He had guys who kept him accountable, who held him to a standard. Their integrity was contagious. And then I think of the exact opposite. I think of the 120 satraps and, and the two administrators who were the opposite of integrity, who were the definition of crooked in their paths, who put, worked up some plot and some scheme to trip up a man of integrity for their own selfish gain. And I can almost picture the scene when, when the king announced that he was going to promote Daniel. I can picture some guy in the front like, who does he think he is? He, he was captured and brought here. I was born here. I deserve that position. Who is Daniel anyway? Right? And I can hear some guy in the background like, yeah, what he said. I never liked Daniel anyway. Sometimes he has bad breath. You know what I'm saying? I can hear them like talking amongst each other like, yeah, Daniel's a jerk. Yeah, he's not very nice. Yeah, I tried to give him a high five the other day and he was like, tried to pound it and it was awkward. <laughs> I've never really been into Daniel, you know? And I can hear them working each other up and then getting together and being like, let's take this guy down. Let's plot on his life. Why? Because their lack of integrity was contagious. We also see in the Bible in, in 1 Corinthians 15, 33, it says, Do not be misled. Bad company corrupts good character. Who you spend time with has a profound effect on whether or not you will walk in integrity. So I just want to ask you real quick, are the people you spend time with, are the closest people in your life, Shadrachs, Meshachs, and Abednegoes? Or are you running around with a bunch of satraps? Because it'll affect whether or not you walk in integrity and it'll affect whether or not you walk securely. The fourth thing I want to close with, and Aurora, you can come up now. The fourth lesson I think we can pull from the life of Daniel is this. Walking with integrity brings, brings glory to God. Walking with integrity brings glory to God. Look with me real quick. It'll be on the screens behind me at Daniel chapter 6, verse 25 through 27. It says, Then King Darius wrote to all nations and peoples of every language in all the earth, May you prosper greatly. I issue a decree that in every part of my kingdom people must fear and reverence the God of Daniel. For he is the living God and he endures forever. His kingdom will not be destroyed. Let me just stop here and remind you, this is a pagan king. Pagan king. His kingdom will not be destroyed. His dominion will never end. He rescues and he saves and he performs signs and wonders in the heavens and on the earth. He rescued Daniel from the power of the lions. Come on, somebody. How many of you guys want your bosses and your coworkers glorifying God like this? How many of you guys want your boss who says they're an atheist, who says that they're an agnostic, who says that they don't believe in God, saying, man, glory to God, look at the integrity in the life of this person. Whew. Walking with integrity brings glory to God, you guys. It's not easy. Seems risky. Man, but it brings glory to God. And when we look at the story of Daniel, he walked with integrity and it gave God a chance to keep him secure, to be glorified in his life. And God was so glorified in the stories and the life of Daniel. And if you and I will just allow the life of Christ to fill us with the desire for integrity, if we'll just allow the Holy Spirit to equip us and enable us to walk in integrity, then our stories and our lives will glorify God. Can you just bow your heads with me? I just want to take a few moments and I just want to ask, ask you to search your heart. Are you walking in integrity? 
Could it be said of you that you walk in integrity and that you walk securely? Are you in a position where integrity seems risky? Are you being tempted right now to compromise your integrity because it seems like you could get ahead? Man, are you walking in private integrity or are you expecting to do it in public without first doing it in private? Are you hanging out with people of integrity? Or are you hanging out with a bunch of satraps? And is your life going to ultimately glorify God because of the integrity you walked in? Just ask yourself those questions. And if you're here this morning and you say, Pastor Daniel, I'm struggling. I need help to walk in integrity. I got news for you. We all do. The only way we can ever hope to walk in integrity is by simply surrendering our lives to the life of Christ and letting his integrity fill us. So if you're here and you say, I'm struggling with walking in integrity, or if you would even say, I might not, you know, might not feel like you're struggling, but you simply want to walk in a higher level of integrity, and you want to invite Jesus just to, to fill you up with his life and his integrity, would you just raise your hand and look up at me? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You can put your hands down. Thank you. God, right now I just come to you in the strong name of your son Jesus. And God, I just pray on behalf of everybody, and especially those people who just raise their hands as a sign that they desire to walk in integrity. Jesus, I pray that you would just fill us up with your life. Holy Spirit, that you would equip us, God, that you would begin to change our desires to desire integrity and to desire, desire you above all things. God, I pray that you would give us the strength, the perseverance, and the determination to never compromise our integrity. God, help us to live lives where we don't have to worry about being found out. And in Jesus' name, I ask that you would help us all to walk securely. Amen. Amen. Let's let them know how much we appreciate it.